What We Wish We Knew About Money Earlier. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, I am excited about this because one of the best things that we get to do as human beings is learn from our past mistakes. And often as time moves on, we build wisdom and that wisdom allows us to make better decisions moving forward. And so you and I have talked about there's a lot of things that we've learned about money either personally, as we have interacted with money or through our clients, that's like, man, I wish I would have caught on to that earlier. If I could tell a young person, you should know this thing, I would camp on this that you should know. Yeah, and that's exactly our annual wealth survey. So many people give that when we have the comments section. It's like, man, why didn't somebody come talk to my 20-year-old self and tell them this? So this is all the nuggets of information that we wish we'd have known earlier. All right, so let's jump into this first one. This first one I really like. I think this is a pretty a pretty unique one. I'm going to give you credit because I think you're the one who came up with this headline. We said that the first thing we wish we would have known about money earlier is that having money is like being cool. What, Brian, what does I, that mean? I feel like we need to snap our fingers while we're talking <laughs> about this. Like, you know, because yeah, that's, cool. know, that's, that's what's cool. You know, it, it's one of those things, if you are cool, you don't try to be exactly cool. Right. This is one of the first things I've learned, not only from watching all those romantic comedy movies about teenagers, uh-huh. you know, you can't buy me love and so forth, is it? But if you're really cool, mm-hmm. you don't try to be cool. Well, the same thing can be said about money. If you have money, you don't have to try to look Mm -hmm. like you have money. And we actually have, look, in the past when we've covered this, we've showed showed really odd-looking people. (laughs) You know, you think about Zuck and his um, pullover, Uh his hoodie. You think about Bill Gates and how he looks all disheveled and stuff. We decided, let's actually marry cool and wealthy together with this, this, this take. Yeah, check out this clip right here. Jay-Z is getting richer and richer, and he's wearing less and less shit that look rich. Does <laughs> yeah. anybody notice that? Hove is the one that's taking these meetings with other wealthy people. Yeah. And you keep going in these rooms with these people trying to look like money. No, you've got to sound like money, <laughs> think like money. My God. Because all of that is a bluff to, to these people. Wealthy doesn't have to prove to anybody that they're wealthy. Mm. Yeah, man, I love that. Wealthy does not have to prove to anybody that they're wealthy. I feel like we live in a society, in a world, and culture where it's all about what can I put on my reel? What can I show on TikTok? What can I put on Facebook to show how successful I've been? But when you actually talk to wealthy people who've had success and been able to do that, it's a lot less about showing that they're wealthy, and it's a lot more about actually having wealth to back it up. Yeah, I even, um, look, I, we won't go into it, but even Chappelle in his uh-huh. most recent Saturday Night Live gave the whole, you know, somebody had said something to him, it's a controversial person, we won't talk about that now, but he's like, oh, I'll put my gold chain inside my oh, shirt for a second. So it is interesting, though, that it seems like the richer people get, the less they care. Mm-hmm. You are constantly lobbying, Bo, and I'm going to put this as a correlation to your success, sure. that we ought to go... Not just jeans every day, mm-hmm. but you think we're going to be wearing the athleisure. Full on athleisure. Just to play joggers, this point. Yep, I don't know it. if I buy into that, but I do know this, is that when you read the book, Dr. Stanley had the book that came out after Millionaire Next Door was Stop Acting Rich. Yep. I'm probably slaughtering this. Stop Acting looking. Rich and Start Living Like a True Millionaire. Because there are. If you look at people who actually have money... They don't waste it. Everything has to have value to it. Now, what's really interesting is there were some in, there were some cool stats that got pulled out of that. Again, now this data is from 2009. We'll address that in a second. But when Dr. Stanley was doing his research, he found that millionaires on average spend $16 on their haircuts. Uh, four in 10 own a bottle of wine that's less than $10. And they on average spend about $31,000 on cars. But Brian, this is obviously data. From 2009, things have changed. Things have shifted. So we wanted to adjust that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we updated it to 2022, inflation adjusted. And you still, look, millionaires spend about $22 on haircuts. Mm-hmm. We actually did went around the room. I think I spent $25 I on haircuts just with 30. this whole inflation. It's not 
Not like I'm trying to load it up with the the hundred dollar haircuts. Four and ten on a bottle under fourteen dollars. I was watching Shark Tank. I heard Kevin O'Leary, who um, you know the Mr. Mr. Wonderful, Wonderful, who's the big wine connoisseur. He said ninety percent of wines consumed are less than fifteen dollars a mm-hmm. bottle that you're that you're buying probably at Costco or places like that. And then they spend a little under forty four thousand dollars on cars. So, you know, if, I, I, you know, and that's why I think we can also extrapolate that to. Dr. Stanley also shared it was the Toyotas, the mm-hmm. Hondas, and those type of models. That's that's right in line with the, a loaded up Honda Accord. So I think that there's a lot to you. Don't have to look rich to actually be wealthy, and that's the key thing I always like to share is that it's much more fun to actually be wealthy than just to look rich. And so, Brian, let's talk about some practical applications on this. Like, if I want to do this, if I want to be someone who actually espouses this, what are the things that I can do? One of the really easy ones is when it comes to spending money, when it comes to using your dollars to do something, focus more on value. Focus on the value of what it is you're getting and less about the show of it. And value means different things to different people. But when you make a purchase, know what and why you are purchasing that specific thing. Yeah, I think I think value is also knowing where the the boundaries are mm-hmm. for your home. You know, it's that 25% of your gross income that we talk about for vehicles. It is the 238 because we talk about that 20% down, don't finance it longer than 3 years, mm-hmm. no more than 8% of your gross income towards those annual payments. And then don't forget I never want you to have more in car payments than what is going towards wealth building with your monthly investments. That type of stuff really does matter, and it also helps show what your purpose is. Are you trying to build wealth, or are you just trying to look cool? Actually being rich and actually having wealth is way better than just looking the part. And if you talk to any successful people, you will see that that is indeed the case. So let's talk about now the second thing. Mm -hmm. Time is more valuable than actually money. Yeah, I think this one is so interesting. And I think all of us, as we begin to age and as time moves on, this becomes more and more real, more and more apparent to us. But young folks, we forget this, right? We think, oh, I've got all the time in the world. I just wish that I had money. I wish that I had that. Not recognizing quite how valuable the time that we have right now truly can be. Yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs Mm -hmm. changed so many of our lives. I can't believe we were looking in show prep. 2011 is when Steve Jobs passed away. His life was amazing and how much he accomplished. But uh, this quote really does put an exclamation on this point. It's, my favorite things in life don't cost any money. Mm -hmm. It's really clear that the most precious resource we all have is time. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was... If you saw the tweet from Elon Musk where he said that Tim Cook and him had gotten together and worked through their differences, it was of the pond around the Apple campus. And I remember it being shared that Steve Jobs, one of his favorite things was going on walks. Around I mean, the he, light he, he on made, campus. If you listen thing. to his autobiography, you will see that whenever he had important decisions to make, Steve Jobs would go on a walk. Well, guess what? Walks don't cost anything, but mm-hmm. this is actually when he did some of his best thinking. It's something as simple as a walk can be tremendously valuable. And I thought that was really cool how Elon, Tim Cook, you know, had gotten together and were using something, that doing something as simple as taking a walk and figuring things out. But, you know, one of the things that we love to do here is we like to actually show you the numbers because it's, it's easy to try to grasp this academically and theoretically. But we wanted to put together a case study to show you, okay, is it true that time can, in fact, be so much more valuable than just money? So we said, let's look at a number of different individuals that are going to set out, and their goal is they're going to save $500 a month over a decade. And we're going to have someone who does it in their 20s and then stops, someone who does it in their 30s and then stops, 40s and then stops. And it's really, really interesting when you watch what happens to the numbers when all you change is the timeline through what you're putting those dollars to work. So if you're someone in your 20s and you say, I'm going to start saving $500 a month in my Roth IRA starting in my 20s, and I'm going to stop it when I turn 30, you will have saved $60,000. You will have put $60,000 into your Roth IRA over that 10-year period. Well, if you let that grow, and we're assuming someone in their 20s can earn a rate of return around 10% over the long term, That $60,000 investment would turn into a million and a half dollars. Certainly, the time in this equation was way more valuable than actually the dollars that you were putting in. 
So let's change the dynamic a little bit, Brian. Let's wait and say, okay, what happens for someone in the 30s? I do think I want to draw attention to the fact that you only put $60,000 in at 65 at retirement. It's worth one5 That means $1,460,000 came from the growth. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Compounding growth, 88 times over, really is the magical thing that will make your journey towards wealth building so much easier. But think about this. What about someone, okay, maybe they couldn't start in their 20s. So they say, okay, for my 30s, for that decade, I'm going to start saving $500 a month every month for that decade, and then I'm going to stop when I get to 40. Well, that person, again, will have saved the same $60,000, but they did not have quite as much time for it to compound. It still turns into $590,000, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's amazing that you have $60,000 that turns into really close to $600,000, but that's different than the million and a half dollars that happened for our 20-year-olds. Wow, we gutted close to a million dollars just by 10 years. So now let's take it even further. Let's look at someone who's in their 40s. Same sort of concept, $500 a month through the decade of your 40s. That $60,000 turns into $250,000. So you can see the amount of time that you let your money work matters. It is incredibly valuable. So the sooner you can figure this out, the better off you will be. So then what happens if you're someone who doesn't just want to save for a decade? What if you're a true financial mutant? And what if a financial mutant grasps this in their 20s and say, you know what, I'm going to start in my 20s. And I'm just going to save $500 a month every month from now until retirement. I'm never going to save more than that. I'm just going to do that. Well, over the course of your working life, from age 20 to 65, you will have saved $270,000. But that $270,000 investment will have grown to over $2.5 million by doing nothing more than saving five. dollars hundred dollars a month. This is one of those important illustrations. Look, it's also going to create some regret that I wish I'd have started sooner. We see that even with our very successful clients. We all could have done more. We could have done better. But the good news is, look, you don't have to get everything perfect in this wealth building journey. If yesterday was the best time to start investing, guess what? The second best answer is start today. Do not let this discourage you. Let this motivate you to actually do something. Okay, Brian, I'm in. You got me sold. I am happy to do this. I'm ready to start investing, but how do I do it? What do I do? How do I think about that? That leads to the third thing that we wish young people know, or wish we would have figured out even earlier in our financial journey, is that lazy investing is the best investing. Brian, what do we mean when we're talking about lazy investing? Well, I think that we live in this new modern world where we're trying to gamify everything. Everything. You you know, we need to have fun. So that's why you see everybody getting distracted by the whole cryptos, the NFTs, and all the stuff, because it it, it encourages you to look at it every day. That's not actually successful Mm -hmm. investing. Successful investing is going to be lazy investing where you set it, forget it, and that automatic, inevitable wealth building process. That's what we want you to focus on. And so why do we say that? Why do we think, because you first tend to think, oh, well, no, I I hear about Warren Buffett. He's out there. He goes and he picks these companies and he buys them. He becomes wildly successful. And that's true. Warren Buffett has made a very interesting career buying whole companies, right? That's kind of the thing that he's done a lot of. But when you actually look at the data, when you look at the analytics around investors, we know that according to the SPIVA data from 2021, over the last decade, the last 10 years, 86% of domestic equity funds underperform their index. So these funds that set out and say, well, our goal in investing is to do better than the index, 86% of them did not beat it. So if There's only a very small portion of managers that can beat the index over the long term. Why try to go out and beat the market? Why don't you just try to be the market? I think it's interesting. You you, you gave the example of Warren Buffett. But remember, Warren Buffett also is the person that if you ask him in an interview, what is the investment that you've told your your beneficiaries mm-hmm. to start investing in after you leave this planet. He always tells everybody the S and P five hundred. Exactly right. Just buy into the growing, ever growing a market. Bet on America. And this is what I think is also interesting. I believe it was around two thousand seven. He made that ten year bet mm-hmm. where anybody who's an active manager or a hedge fund, he put up money to a charity, of course, sure. and said, "Hey, if you really believe in what you're doing." Come and put your money against what I think the S and P five hundred will do. And you would think. 
from a historical standpoint, because we had the collapse of the Great Recession mm-hmm. in 2008, this would have destroyed his bet. But we all know the rest of the story. Warren won that he bet. Won they it. actually called it early because it was such a thumping mm-hmm. that, that this thing ended. Guys, you're going to learn if you just will be consistent, don't outsmart yourself. Just put your money to work on the ever-expanding, accelerating rates of return of the global economy and even the U.S. economy with the S&P 500. You will be successful. But maybe you say, no, Brian, I'm not, I'm not that kind of investor. Maybe you fall into the camp where you say, I got it figured out. I can read the tea leaves. I know what's going to happen. I can do that. Or maybe you're the person who says, you know what, if, if it weren't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. So if I even think about doing this investing thing, I'm probably going to get it wrong and I'm probably going to buy at the worst time. Well, we said, well, let's look at that. Let's think about three different investors. Let's think about the best investor, right? Let's call him Billy. And let's say that he has figured out where the bottom of every single market is. And let's say he started his financial journey in 1980. And back in 1980, Average income was $12,500. So if Billy is going to save 25%, that's about $260 a month, he's only going to invest at the very lowest point of every bear market that we saw from 1980 all the way until now. So he's going to build cash, build cash, build cash, and then he's going to dump in the market on the lowest day. So this this ties in because we have a lot of people right now going, I would not. If you go look at our comment section whenever we do, hey, the market's been volatile, what should you do? There's always some some trollish. We won't call them full on trolls. It's just they're in that trolls transformation. In but yeah, they're trolls in training. Well, they'll say, "This is why I'm in cash. I'm waiting until we get to the right moment, and I'm going to buy." This is the person that somehow has that spidey sense that they're going to stick the landing and build cash, but then buy on the maximum financial mm-hmm. opportunity. It'd be an incredible. It'd be an incredible illustration, but also an incredible skill set to be able to actually do that. It would be. But then there's also let's say. Let's look at another investor. We're going to call her Unlucky Ursula. She's going to take the same strategy, but poor girl just can't get right, right? So let's assume that she has the exact same savings rate, but instead of buying at the bottom of every bear market, she buys at the top of every bull market. So she really gets her timing wrong. And then let's just kind of have this throwaway third person. We're going to call her Diane. And let's just say she says, I don't know how to time it. I'm going to just do it. Every single month. So Billy has it figured out. Ursula can't get out of her own way. And Diane is just going to be the lazy one. Well, when you think about entry dates, we're showing a chart right here. This shows the S&P 500 from 1980 all the way until now. So everywhere that you see a red uh, number is where Ursula is going to buy. It's the top of the bull market. Everywhere that you see green is where Billy's going to buy. He is going to buy at the bottom. So you can see... He's got it figured out. She does it. And Diane, remember, she's just the one who's kind of boring. She's just going to buy every month, stay consistent this whole time. She, she, let's just let's put a quote to it. Instead of timing the market, she's going to take advantage of just time in the That's market. That's exactly right. And I thought it was interesting. Ursula, by the way. I don't know if that means Daniel has been watching uh, The Little Mermaid that's be what it is. or what, but it, it, you, you can't help but focus on that. And then... She's always showing up a day late, mm-hmm. you know, or a day early of That's when right. the best opportunity is. And then, of course, you have who, who's the maximizer? Who's who's nailing this? This What's, is Billy. Billy the best. Billy the best is always buying at the peak opportunity. It will be amazing to see how this plays out. All right. So we know that all three of these investors, they had the same income, they had the same savings rate. So they all saved exactly $132,436 over this time period. That's how much they put to work. Well, Billy was able to turn that $132,000 into $1.77 million. Woo. That is remarkable. Over a 42-year time period, $132,000 turned into one point seven seven. That's unbelievable. Ursula, who got it completely wrong, still ended up a millionaire. Her $132,000 turned into over $1.1 million, which is still great. So you can be bad, the worst at investing, and still come out with seven figures on a modest investment. That's, That's exactly pretty incredible, right. actually. That's exactly right. So you would assume, okay, Diane, she's probably going to come in somewhere in between. Well, if you look at her investment, she actually became a multimillionaire. It's she to... ended up with over $2 million at the end of this little experiment. It's back to time in the market. That's exactly Time right. in the market, lazy investing, 
wins out. You don't have to worry about all the fluctuations. You don't have to worry about the news cycle. You just set it, forget it, know what you need to be saving. And that's why we always focus on, hey, if you can focus on saving and investing 25% of your gross income, you will be successful. And that's why I think practical application. Where are you at in this process? Yep. If you're below $500,000, Take the emotion out of it, buy into an indexed, low-cost indexed mm -hmm. target retirement That's fund great. that does all the asset allocation. All you have to do is figure out how much I can save each month, when do I need the money, let it do the heavy lifting. Now, once you get over that critical mass of 500000 yes, we can then focus on asset allocation, asset location, but let's get the fundamentals, the basics, and let your wealth be on that fundamental, set it, forget it, automatic, inevitable wealth building process. And Mel, here's the thing. It's not it's not sexy. This isn't like cocktail party talk. No one's going to want to hear how, how, oh man, hey, guess what? A dollar cost averaged every single month throughout the course of the year. You're probably not going to get people to crowd around your room, but remember, it's better to actually build wealth than to try to talk about what you've been doing to build wealth. So how can you stay consistent? What's something that you can do to make sure that you stay on the right tr on the right path and on the right track? We got to listen to the fourth thing we wish that we would have realized earlier is that money does not watch the news. It's so important because everything I said about that inevitable we inevitable wealth building journey is most of us get distracted. We're our own worst enemies. There's always been these behavioral studies. They show if you just if you invested in the S&P 500, it consistently earns somewhere between 9 to 11% mm -hmm. on a long-term historical basis. Yet when you look at the average investor, it's usually much less than half of that performance. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we always go through the cycle of market emotions, meaning that we will think we're geniuses when markets are making money, but then when things get scary and the economy is going through its typical cycle of cleansing, we jump out mm -hmm. because we're like, you know what, done with this. I'm not going to ride it out. I get out because I'm influenced by what's going on in the news. Um, it, you know, if it bleeds... It leads yep. is what the news media, they don't make their money off of your financial success. They make their money by keeping your eyes and your ears peeled on the fear mongering that's going on TV. So be careful what motivates you and influences your behavior. So let's see how good they can, because if, if uh, politics and news and commentators, if those are the things that are influencing our, influencing our decisions... Let's see how good they are. How often do they point us in the right direction? Well, check out this headline from Financial Times. It says, the risk of double dip recession is rising. Now, we scrubbed all the dates off of this because we want you to think about in your financial journey, when do you remember the risk of a double dip recession rising? When was that something that was alarming to you? Well, if you actually go look at when this headline came out, it was August 23rd of 2009. We know that the market hit its bottom of the Great Recession on March 9th of 2009. So here we are a few months after that. If you look at the three years following when this article came out, the S&P 500 over that time period returned 37.6% over the next three years. But you, you can realize how this plays out. In August of 2009, when the Financial Times came out, the risk of a double-dip recession mm -hmm. is rising. We had just made it through the Great Recession, where 2008 was crushed. The first quarter of 2009, we had hit the bare bottom. Now we had been on this rapid increase. It probably started feeling better. And then here's the cold water from the Financial Times saying, whoa, don't get too excited. Mm -hmm. We actually could have a double-dip recession yep. If you panicked and sold out at that point, you would have missed out on another 40% over the upcoming three years. Do not let the news media distract you from the wealth building journey. But that was back in the Great Recession. Okay, maybe they got that wrong. Let's. Th but they get better. They get better over time. Well, check out this headline. This is from the Mercury News. It says, the economist who predicted the busted housing bubble says another recession is coming. Well, uh -oh. If this guy... If he called the housing bubble, he must be on the he must be in the know. He must know what he's doing. He must have this thing figured out. Well, if you look, this article actually came out in July of 2014. Well, if you think about the three years following July of 2014, the S&P 500 over that time period 
returned almost 25% over that next three years. It did not look like a recession came and actually hit the financial markets. What I find interesting about this chart is if you look at 2014, we know now through the 2020 hindsight vision that 2015 was actually a not a great year mm-hmm. to be an investor because that's when Europe got into some debt crisis. Mm-hmm. If you remember the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain all had debt crises, and it drove the stock market down in 2015. If you read the news cycle both in 2014, 2015, you'd be like, man, I'm going to wait until the coast thing. is clear. But yet, look, it was a lot of volatility. Still, you'd have come out on the other side with that ever-expanding economy where, yes, you can still make money even when the headlines are pretty scary. And so now let's look at one more. This is from the Wall Street Journal. This says, why soaring assets and low unemployment mean now is the time to start worrying. And this article actually came out in July of 2017. What I think is so interesting is if you look at the next three years after this headline came out, the S&P 500 still made 32%. And what's so interesting about this time period is we have fourth quarter of 18, where we know that the market dropped 20%. And then we have the entire COVID market downturn that fit inside of this. Even with those two drastic downturns, three years following this article, S&P 500 has still made 32% over that time period. It's important to repeat, money doesn't watch the news. And I think if you were looking at practical application, is know what what information is actionable versus Mm non-actionable. A lot of this is just noise. It's not actually doing any good for you to hyper-focus on it. Focus on what you can control, which is your savings and investment rate, how you live your life, how you invest to make that money work for you so you don't have to, so you have a plan so that you don't have to work as hard as you get older, that's actually what is important, what you can control. I love it, Brian, that you called it noise, because if you think about it, the noise never goes away. If you look at headlines all the way back from 2009, the last big recession that we came through, the last significant, significant, long-tenured market downturn, All the way up this mountain of worry, there were more headlines saying, recession, here it comes. Uh Uh-oh, big banks are going to, here's soaring assets. Wall Street thinks a double dip. The noise will always be there no matter what market environment we're in. You have to train your brain to be a financial mutant that does not get distracted by that. I've seen illustrations that will show you something negative in every single year we live in. Yep. I think it's, um, look, the news cycle, they have to fill it. They have to fill all the newspapers and all the time on the TV shows with something. And as humans, the, the, the instinctual side is we remember the negative much more than the positive. So that's what they're going to focus on. Don't let that be the kryptonite that keeps you from building that long-term success. All right, and the fifth thing that we wish we would have known sooner, that we would encourage people to learn and figure out as early as possible, is when it comes to money and when it comes to wealth, it is simply just a tool. It's a thing that should allow you to be able to focus on the things that you want to focus on. It, in and of itself, should not be the goal. Well, I always think, because you say a tool, you, tool requires practice. Mm-hmm. Tool requires that you spend some time figuring out how to use it appropriately. And I, but I feel like a lot of times, since there's not a lot of education and training on money, a lot of people just make up random goals. They'll mm-hmm. say, you know what? My life is not what I want it to be right now, but I bet if I could save up $2 million or $3 million, all then my dreams would be fulfilled. Be I'd be fixed. happy. Everything would be so much easier. And that might be true, but what would actually create that truth? The truth is, is what could that $2 million or $3 million do for you? And I think that's the part that a lot of people, they, they have this just number without the purpose or the why for it, so it's just empty. If you mm-hmm. think that money will bring you fulfillment, then you're missing a lot of the steps. There's a reason that planning goes into this. Why do so many lottery winners do so poorly with it versus the people who build it up over decades are very fulfilled, mm-hmm. and it's not the money that brought the fulfillment. Look, money makes life easier, no doubt, but it's the journey, it's the understanding that it's a tool and what it can and, and how it all works is actually what fills in all those gaps that get so many people in traps. What I think is so interesting is if you set simply a financial goal, 
you'll find the goalpost moves. Oh, if I could just make this income. Well, you get there, then you want to make a little bit more. And then you get there, you want to make more. If I could just hit this net worth number, okay, well, then you get there. And well, what about this number? What about this number? It's why when we talk on our course about why you should know your number, Knowing your number is the gateway into being able to do the things that you love. I have a dear friend of mine who was wildly successful in a Fortune 100 company, and he gave me a great piece of advice early on. He said, Bo, here's what I want you to do as a young man. Envision the life that you want to live, right? Like think about the family and the house and the vacations and the things that you want to do, and go ahead and decide that right now while you don't have a lot of resources. And if you can keep that vision in your mind of what you want to be doing, Work towards that goal. Don't let it be a dollar goal. Don't let it be a specific number, but let it be a goal where, hey, I can go on this many trips a year and I can do this with my kids and I can spend this time with my family and work towards that. If you can keep that in the forefront of your vision and always focus on that, it will help prevent you from allowing your lifestyle to keep creeping further and further and further and further out. Well, I, I think there's this insatiable hunger that um, I have found with success. And what, what, 25-year-old Brian driving through a neighborhood and what I thought was like, oh my gosh, these people are rich. rich. This is a it changes. Effort. I mean, and that's why I love that guidance that you received on that is because it lets you address it while you're in this hunger phase so that when you do reach this abundance phase, you don't change the goalpost. I was talking to a client yesterday and they're in that phase where he's about to, it's a couple they're about to walk through that threshold of financial independence. They got more than enough money. They're going to be happy. But part of this plan is, is that we're also going to sell the big house. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to, they're going to relocate closer to one of the children for grandkids and other things. And I always think it's interesting that when I see people buying the mega house in their 40s, when their kids are five years from leaving the house, is that the right way? Mm -hmm. I, I would much more rather see you use money as a tool where you're buying, that's why we offer you the 30-year mortgage versus the 15-year. When you're in your 30s, the messy middle, so you have as maximum flexibility yep. to buy the house that you can raise the kids, because more than likely when you get to your late 40s, early 50s, downsizing is going to become more mm -hmm. of a thing. Don't do, I see so many people building these mega houses to, for two people to live in, mm -hmm. and that just feels a little less purposeful. And that's why I, I, I want you to always think about the why. Mm -hmm. What is the reason you're using your money this way so that it can have the most impact? So it's also when you're young and maybe you're a hyper saver, it's not a miser moment. Mm -hmm. It's actually a purposeful moment of why you're saving. But it's also why you're older. You're not just buying stuff for the sake of buying. You're actually having a purpose for it. I always hear people say, I want to do what I want, when I want, and how I want. And that's a good, that's what I think that's the financial independence goal. Sure. But is that the abundance goal? That's why when we talk about the five levels of wealth, we went a step further with building abundance. And we said it goes into know who you are, know what you value, and what brings you purpose. If you can check the box on those things, man, look out. I mean, because that's what I have found reaching this stage of success now where I don't make decisions on, is this the best financial mm -hmm. thing? No, this is the thing that gives me the most value from a purpose standpoint. And and, I, and what I love is when you don't have to do things because you have to financially, it opens up this whole new world. And what I've seen is like I started doing the podcast to share this vision mm -hmm. of a classroom, online classroom for people who did not qualify for fee-only fiduciary advisors. And then we transitioned into YouTube. Mm -hmm. We had to buy all this equipment. This was, if you looked at how much all this studio and equipment costs at the time, it seemed like ridiculous. Yeah. Why would you do this? But it's all worked out because the why, the purpose, all kind of had meaning to it. So now I'm finding that things that I didn't do because it was a financial decision, I did it because it brought me happiness mm -hmm. and fulfillment actually has turned out to have this exponential mm -hmm. abundance thing that's happened. You guys are part of that. And I just want you to do the same thing with your money. If you're looking at money as something that gives you value versus just a tool, you'll miss it. And I want you just to pay attention in the world you live in so you know how to use money in the best maximizing way to give you the life that you deserve from working so hard and it should be fulfilled 
and filled with abundance. Yeah, if you can figure out these things, there's a lot of stuff that, yeah, maybe you didn't figure it out in your 20s and maybe you didn't figure it out in your 30s. But even if you're figuring it out now, recognizing how valuable your time can be and how to ignore the noise of the financial markets and how to stay consistent and how to understand your why and how to know how to use money the right way and how to build wealth in the right way, the sooner you figure those things out, Frankly, the easier your financial journey feels because you know where you're moving towards and why you're moving in that direction. So hopefully you're able to take and learn from some of the things that we've learned and you can imply them now to your life to take your finances to the next level. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hanson, Money Got Team, out.